Hi. So today, let's talk about sonatory bees. Uh, I I think they're often very under underrepresented in the conversation around bees, but they're vital and incredibly important pollinators. Uh, people don't really kind of talk about them that much, or people don't even know that they exist. But there are about two hundred and fifty different solitary bee species in the UK, um, and among that two hundred and fifty bees, there's a diverse range of appearance. So some are very tiny, some are much larger difference in behaviors, difference in needed habitats, and difference in foraging. So, so they tend to be much more specialists, um, but they're vital, vital pollinators and often very, very effective pollinators. Um, I think part of the reason why we talk about them less is because we're less able to control them, um, but actually we can do things to support them to thrive in our gardens um, and to help uh, minimize the decline that's already happening. So let's um, let's go through and, and talk about their life cycle in a little bit of detail so we can understand how they're living. So in the springtime, they'll begin to uh, hatch out and generally the, the eggs are laid in, in little hollows. So they'll, they're kind of in a tube in little chambers and, and the, the ones the closest to the entrance are the smaller chambers and they're generally the males. Uh, so the males will begin to hatch out first and they kind of hatch out of their little tube one by one and they'll start going out into the spring landscape which is hopefully full of pollen and full of nectar and they'll start foraging. The males uh, ideally will be looking to, to mate with the females and then once the females are thoroughly mated they'll begin to start thinking about uh, making a nest space. So they'll start looking for their own kind of hollow whether it's a hollow stem of a plant or a, or a cavity in a brick or, or whatever it might may be and they'll go into their little hollow they'll start provisioning it with pollen so they'll make a little kind of um, ball of pollen with a little bit of nectar mixed into it and then they'll lay an egg onto that pollen and then they'll seal them in in a little chamber so that the in this chamber will have an, uh, the, enough pollen to provide for this little larvae as it grows and then eventually that egg will hatch and will start eating its way through the pollen and get kind of fatter and fatter you know a little little kind of larval grub and then once it reaches its full size it will weave a little cocoon around itself and then go through kind of various transformations until the point where it's more or less an adult bee and generally that will kind of happen over the winter and then so when the next spring comes they're ready to hatch out and, and continue this cycle so uh, like I said, there's a whole enormous range of different uh, solitary bees. Uh, I've included some pictures, so hopefully you can kind of get a sense of that. Um, one of the ones I've included are the Osmia bees or the Mason bees, which are ones that are reasonably common and you're kind of likely to bump into in your garden. Uh, they're very efficient pollinators. They have this lovely furry kind of underbelly. So every time they land on a flower, they're, they're, that gets covered in pollen and it gets transferred very efficiently. Um, some of the osmias will let nest in snail shells um, or, or they'll kind of be in, in these tubes or, or cavities that I've talked about. I've included some images of, the, uh, of, a, of a nest box where you can see all the different cells. So hopefully that makes it a bit clearer what I'm talking about. So each of these cells has been provisioned by, by pollen and the osmias are, are kind of sealing up the gaps with clay. So they generally will forage a little bit of clay um, so it's kind of good to have access to, uh, so that they can find access to damp clay in the environment and they can use it to seal up their chambers. I've also included some images of the mega chile, which are also great pollinators. Uh, they're a group of leaf cutting bees and, and you can see in the images associated with them that they, they're using these, these little portions of leaf to kind of seal up the chambers rather than using clay. And they're the ones that are cutting these lovely perfectly circular um, uh, segments out of generally they, they often like rose leaves so some gardeners rose gardeners don't like them because they cut these little holes out but they you might you might stumble upon one flying past you carrying enormous um, chunk of leaf um, so they're all of these all of these uh, solitary bees are wonderful wonderful pollinators and and really we should be thinking about uh, creating landscapes which can support all of these wild bees and have them as the primary pollinators and then be supplemented by by honeybees um, 
So like the bumblebees, the, the, cuckoo, the uh, solitary bees also have cuckoo solitaries um, that, that sneak in and uh, sneak their eggs into cells and are not doing the, the child rearing work. There's about 67 of the solitary bees that are also cuckoos. Um, so, so there's this incredible dance of cuckoo species ad adapting to being with um, with the solitary bees. Um, so, one thing we can be doing to support solitary bees is is providing nectar and providing pollen in our gardens. But also, we can build uh, nesting habitats for them. So, hopefully, uh, we'll have some other videos up that go into a lot more detail about that. But there's just a few quick tips for for once you've built uh, for building and for siting your your hotel because we can if we don't get it right the hotels then actually they don't function in the way that's good for the bees so firstly they need to be fixed to something stable they don't have them on a branch so they're kind of swinging around and ideally they'll be south facing and in the sun so the bees like a nice warm space to be in if you put it in the dark damp corner in the garden the bees won't won't enjoy being there Another thing that's really important is that the, the, the cavities that we're, used, that we're, that we're creating, whether it's a, a bamboo hollow or drilling a holes or whatever, ideally we want to make it so that they're replaceable or cleanable. So Because what can happen is um, sometimes a bee will die in there or sometimes other parasites get in um, and then the, the, the cavities itself get filled with um, uh, bacteria and things that aren't great for the bees. So, that, so they, over time they become less than ideal nesting sites for the young bees. So we want to be able to either replace our bamboo tubes, which we should do every couple of years, or replace our blocks if we're drilling holes in blocks, or we want to be able to access the, the, the cavities so that we can clean them out. Another factor is having smooth edges on our cavities. So if we're drilling a hole, you want to make sure you, you sand the entrance, because if there's splinters or things like that, that can tear the wings of the bees. Um, so they either just won't go in or they'll go in and be damaged by it. Um, and you want to make sure you've got the right size cavities for the right size bee that you're trying to encourage. So different bees are different sizes and they'll need different nesting, bot, uh, nesting uh, cavity sizes. And also it's nice to have a, a range of, of diversity. So, you, so you, you're, you're kind of encouraging a range of different solitary bees into your garden. Okay, we'll have fun hopefully encouraging solitary bees in your garden and I hope that was useful.